and now we're recording. Welcome everyone for our Christmas Eve Body Char Regeneration Fund work group meeting. I'm both very happy to spend time with you as my surrogate family today, and hopeful that your being here doesn't mean that you're too far from your family. I hope you're able to spend time with your families today. Um, you know, Jessica and I have family in Missouri and Illinois um, that are far enough away from us that we don't have any plans with them. And all of our friends here in Columbia are with their families. So Christmas is actually really laid back for us. And we had a pretty, I wouldn't say intense, but just an active day for the solstice, doing a lot of things with our family. And so Christmas for us is really low key. Um, which is why I was like, I'll just host a meeting and see who shows up. Um, so I'm really glad you guys are here. Yeah. And what I'd love to do today, since there are nine of us here, you know, um, Allison, for, for your benefit, we'll do an opening circle and make some introductions because I think everyone else knows each other at this point. Okay. Um, we'll do introductions to help you feel welcome. And uh, just so you know, also, there are about 30 people in this group, in this work group. Um, so we have almost a third of us here today, which is really nice. Um, so what I'd love to do to start forming an agenda is actually invite us to create an agenda together in the opening circle. So what that means is some of you probably have questions and confusion, um, passion and motivation, where you're like, I'd really like us to be doing this in the work group, or I don't know what the hell's going on, <laughs> or some other feeling. And the way we can create an agenda right now that lets us begin to work with whatever those feelings are is I'd like to invite each of you as we do an opening circle. Um, for the sake of Allison, who's just joined us, we connected on Twitter the other day, had a nice exchange, and it felt really nice to welcome her into this group so that we could be more friendly than 140 character limits. Um, and so it might be really nice for us to do a brief introduction to ourselves so that, so that she has a sense of who's here as well. And it'd be nice for us to maybe start with, you know, like here's my, in, my invitation for the opening circle, is if you can just say, maybe say your name and where you're located. And just one thing about yourself, one thing about your background or who you are or what you love. You, free reign what you want to share about yourself. But just your name, where you're located, and something about yourself. And then the fourth thing, which is probably the most important thing, is what would you like us to discuss today in the agenda? Like, what would we like to use this time for? And so it could be, I'm new here, just give me an overview. Could, an overview would be a great agenda. And what is actually going on here and what are we all doing? Um, I will give some updates and have some things to share, but, but before structuring it anymore, I'd like to just co-create an agenda. And what I will do, um, quick question, PJ, are you taking notes again? Like you were last time? You in a position to do that? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm taking notes right now. I'm trying to get the link here to drop it in the chat. I'm on a separate device, so. Awesome. Um, are you able to put this round of notes into the chat, like catch, capturing the agenda items? Could you do that? Yeah. Maybe if you can't, um, you, if you're able, that'd be great. Then we can create the agenda from that list. So PJ is going to make an effort to summarize what each of us says is our agenda item. And to make it easier on everyone, I'll invite PJ to go first so he doesn't have to think about, or maybe I'll invite PJ to go second. Um, so that you have a moment to think, but then you can just pay attention to note taking after that. Um, and I'll start. And I'll just start by saying, uh, hi, Allison, my name's Joe. I'm based in Barichara, Colombia, which is in the turn of the Northern Andes where it starts to go away from Venezuela and back toward Panama. And uh, one thing to know about me is uh, I grew up on a chicken farm in Missouri and uh, my life passion has been applied philosophy, really learning how to be really rigorous and clear in their understandings of what the world is and how it works. Um, so a couple little things about me. And I will withhold agenda items so that I don't bias anyone's response. And then I'll come back and help create the agenda afterwards. 
but I'd like to invite PJ to go next. And then um, we'll pass it forward. So PJ will pass it to the next person and onward each person passes to the next until we get through all of this. So PJ, on to you. All right. Uh, I think I just dropped the link to the notes in the chat for today. Um, so feel free to follow along there. And um, so I am PJ Connolly. Currently, right now, I am in Florida, uh, on the east coast of Florida, um, southeast of Orlando, in Melbourne, on the former lands of the Ais people, um, and or the lands of the former Ais people, uh, no longer exist, unfortunately, um, and. I, let's see, agenda notes or what I wanna see on the agenda today. Um, I would like to talk about some, uh, what we see as sort of the concrete next steps and, and maybe doing some brainstorming around that. Um, Cause I think we're, we're all in a, I think last meeting was really good um, in terms of sort of, uh, seeing that everybody seemed to be on board and, and finding the, the true purpose of the group. Um, and I just, that's what I feel like is the next thing to be doing is uh, figuring out, okay, what are some concrete things we can be working on, so. Thanks, PJ. Uh, pass it on mm -hmm. and I captured your agenda item in the, in the chat box. Awesome, thanks. I'm gonna pass it to Max. All right, thank you, PJ. Thank you, Joe, for inviting us to uh, co-create the agenda of this group. Um, I'm Max, uh, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, something about me that I was thinking about this morning, I saw this picture of, um, um, there's uh, someone who's in the healing arts, um, her name's Lisa Lola, and she had a picture of herself in the woods. And it reminded me of how, I'm a musician, and. I uh, used to go out with my friend, we'd go in the woods and I'd be, I'd take a picture, we'd take a picture of me like being out in the woods, like, I, you know, like I'm creeping through the woods like a wizard kind of guy. And I realized it's actually kind of a theme, you know, it's kind of a theme among uh, artists to try to appear in natural places. And I guess, so I'm just gonna kind of shift into, uh, well, anyways, I'll just say a bit more about that. Um, uh, it, it, it occurred to me that there's this kind of like ubiquitous understanding that there's like a need to return to a more natural way of being, but it gets, it gets communicated, I think, uh, through images a lot of times by artists um, without that really being named. But um, one thing that I'd like uh, to, uh, for this meeting to achieve is to um, kind of be able to kind of remain in touch with the meta a little bit because I'm here to learn. I'm here to like learn how to apply um, the principles um, of what we're doing here to um, subsequent contexts as well as to the bar Barichara uh, context. So that's just my little piece. And I will uh, call on Gail. Hey everyone, I'm Gail Colin. I live in Queens in New York City. Um, something about me is I'm a huge bird and particularly parrot lover, and I'm co-director of a nonprofit One Earth Conservation that does parrot conservation work in Latin America. We're hoping that maybe we can get involved in Barichara, where there's something brewing, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, and that's Dusty behind me. He's almost 30 years old. He's an amazing little bird. Um, and uh, I, PJ pretty much said what's on my mind, which I, I'm very much about taking action and steps. So I'd like to like work on something. Um, so uh, I'd love to do the same, brainstorm some, brainstorm some next steps. And I'll call on Tyler. Thanks, Gail. Hey all, I'm Tyler. I'm calling in from Baltimore, Maryland uh, in my childhood home, getting to spend some time with mom this holiday season. Um, one thing about myself, that's 
so funny to try and just pick one out of a million. Mm-hmm. But um, I guess that, um, yeah, I think like Max, I'm kind of viewing my participation here as first and foremost, a, a learning experience for myself, but one that's been guided by a desire to contribute and help um, push this mission along however I can. Um, but I, I find kind of taking action generally to be the most insightful learning rather than just sitting around listening to things and uh, hearing people talk. So um, I see them as one and the same. Um, but yeah, in terms of agenda item, I think along with concrete next steps, I tend to find it useful to have some goals around timelines. Um, and I know other people don't always feel that way. So I'm just looking to have a discussion about if this group feels like setting some dates and, and whether that's fundraising amounts or other sort of objective milestones, whether it'd be helpful to start putting together a timeline. And okay. let's see, I'll pass it to Rachel. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Rachel Olson. I am currently parked uh, in the Madison, Wisconsin area. Um, I, I have lived here for a while, but I am not right now. I'm I'm uh, I've pulled up roots and I'm waiting to kind of see where my next home is going to be. In that uh, that hasn't quite. Uh, revealed itself yet. So I'm in a, a liminal place uh, in my life. I feel like my life is my kind of my, pro- my primary regenerative project is, you know, how I live. And so that's um, kind of where I am. But I'm, I'm, I'm part of this group um, because I have a, a, a strong background in um, program management and design and development and fundraising and organizational uh, development so in the in the faith-based and and also secular nonprofit world but I realized that a lot of what I know is very much part of the old model and so I am here to see what can be transferred uh, to the new model of doing things, new models as they emerge and are formed, but also to learn and, and uh, you know, be transformed along with our systems uh, to become a, an integral player in, in these new ways of, of doing things. So I'm very interested in new kinds of fundraising, new kinds of um, engagement, things that are generative and and uh, healthy and holistic and uh you know letting go of some of the things that maybe um are not going to come with us on this journey so so that's that's where i am and as far as agenda goes i um i'm here to learn so uh, i i would really like to see us you know maybe make some concrete steps i think that's helpful i, I like the idea of of looking at uh some I think the spirit is in the right place. So now I think, you know, looking for some some bits of form and structure. I think I think we're ready for that. So uh, so I'm, and I think that's what I'm hoping for also today. And with that, uh, maybe uh, Stan would like to speak. Sure. Thanks, Rachel and Joe and everybody. Um, so I'm Stan Curtis. I live near Portland in Lake Oswego, which is part of Cascadia. And you know, Oregon City was the end of the Oregon Trail, so it's a historic fishery, second biggest waterfall after Niagara. Uh, my family are settlers from Missouri. Uh, part of them came out with uh, Brigham Young. We have a lot of fanatics in the family. My wife was part Indian, and so we we have indigenous uh, stories that go back to the Rockies and uh, Lewis and Clark. <laughs> Um, so it's I'm very interested in the, I met Joe tipping me off on how to hunt mushrooms. You were even generous enough to share your Olympic Peninsula favorite kind of places, which we'd yeah. never do with fishing. <laughs> we have so many favorite mushroom foraging places in the Cascades and Olympics that we can share a few. <laughs> yeah, and, and then just the one thing about me, I'm very, um, I'm an engineer, so I'm kind of tone deaf on the pro-social. So that's why I'm here. 
and I'm in uh, pet training. My wife is a medical doctor and a dog, dog whisperer here in Portland. Um, and we have a pet cockatiel. So my, my cockatiel is training me on better, better spouse relationships. It's working great. <laughs> Uh, and singing. So, um, and then what I'm hoping to get out of this, are, there are kind of two things. Uh, I've been really active in this kind of stuff with Stuart Cowan and a lot of the math guys for some time. Uh, but I think this is the hot project because it's about change, not about math. And so I'm very interested in sort of how Joe's so successful at building trust because I really want to do this kind of stuff in my own backyard. And I think that's the bottleneck. And then in terms of agenda, I think trust is the bottleneck and uh, there's a need for public private trust at different scale. So I'm very interested in the financial models and the uh, community models for, for trust in, in the economic sense as well as the social sense. And uh, Mercy Corps here locally is famous for community investment trusts. Portland's been very active with the B corporations and the food economy. Uh, and we've done a lot of work with Columbia as kind of a showcase for uh, the fair coffee exchange and farming. So I think the food economy and your food forest pilot might be something we could incubate here locally in my backyard. Um, so I think that's my agenda here is to try to see, uh, you know, the things I can copy back to my backyard, frankly. Um, and then we're doing pilots, I, I should say, we're doing pilots in Portland and uh, Seattle and Vancouver, BC, because we're very well connected to the University Research Network. So that's a little bit of a bias that I need to watch out for. <laughs> anyway, cheers. Great group. And Stan, well, would you like to pass it on? Yeah, if, if Amber's there. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm from Ojai, California, uh, indigenous to our people, the Shumash people. And um, usually, I'm, I mean, recently this, these meetings have been held during a, a scheduling conflict with uh, an internship, I mean, a residency that I'm in. Um, so unfortunately, I, had, I missed the last one, but um, there's a break for a Christmas holiday. Uh, right now, so I figured I, I would hop on and catch up, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just stoked to be here, and I'm here to catch up on the last meeting that I missed, and um, offer any support as things unfold, and uh, initiatives and agenda proposals have already been issued from other other folks that I agree with, like a timeline or uh, points of action that we can leap onto at this point moving forward. Um, and about myself, I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm in Ohio. I'm, I'm actually looking to, <clears throat> excuse me, move to Los Osos maybe. So I'm considering mm -hmm. a, a different, uh, moving away from my present career as a caregiver and diving into regeneration full-time and working in the farming communities mm -hmm. there in Los Osos. So that's what's happening for me recently. And I'm really glad to be here. Uh, Allison. Hey there. Hi guys. Um, I'm Allison. This is the First meeting that I've I've been to, like uh, Joe said, um, we just had a an exchange. I guess I've I saw I've been following him for a while and, and interested in some of the work that he's been doing. But um, you know, I saw the the GoFundMe and I looked into it and I thought, oh, this is this is so interesting. And um, I guess I consider myself part of the crypto sphere. Um, so I don't know how much people know about it, but you know, it's more than just the cryptocurrencies, it's like a whole community, um, but it's a lot of different groups and communities. And there's a lot of, of money. <laughs> and, um, you know, you see all of these crazy things where it's just money is just almost like nothing. It's just created from nothing. It's, you know, people are accumulating as much as it as they can. And then there's these people within it who are also some of the most, um, you know, change the world type of people as well. And so when I saw his GoFundMe and then I see other people talking about like, you know, they press one button and they made all this money. It's just something in my brain just 
is like going nuts and it's just you know I just started tagging people and you know it's like how can we how can we in this like cryptocurrency sphere that is you know trying to make move to new paradigms and trying to change things but there's just so much money and then there's these projects that are so important and how can we link that up and you know I know it's it's difficult and Joe knows a lot of the people that I was talking about that I consider like the real true um you know, the people that I feel co the most comfortable with because they are really the ones that aren't just in it for the tech or aren't in it for the libertarian weird views but to actually change things and to to you know the the frameworks of cryptocurrency I think are so interesting because a lot of them are moving to you know sort of co-op-y type of models shared ownership where it's not just accumulation for one party so I feel like there's so much there that most people don't even have any idea about and it's going to take us a while for the for that group to <laughs> to have a little more sway and influence but I guess that all those things kind of swirling around um and and I just thought saw this project and I've, I've been really interested in regenerative practices and ideas I came upon something uh, not even that long ago a month or two ago about regenerative capitalism and um you know I guess for me I've always felt this real sort of two sides of myself, like I, I see lots of people are able to find these really specific niches and really go full into it. So it's like, if you are, you know, somebody who's more of the do-gooder type, it's, you also tend to be vegan and you tend to like have no material possessions and you tend, you know, it's like everybody goes into these extremes. And, and I guess for me, I've never, I've never felt that I, totally fit into that, but I don't fit into this weird capitalist mold. And so it's, I've always been trying to balance and it's, it's hard to find, I guess, in my opinion, where I can fit. But what came to me is that, you know, we have to, we can't leap into like totally new things. We have to softly change. And so regenerative capitalism made a lot of sense. And then I watched that new David Attenborough movie and I was just like so wrecked after that because I thought, you know, over time people will change. We will get there right now. We're just not evolved enough, but then realizing, whoa, like we don't have time <laughs> for that. And it, you know, for a week or two, I was very, very depressed. And then I thought, okay, how can I channel this into something more helpful? And so all these things just started coming together. And then, and then Joe invited me here. And I guess, you know, it's nice to see that Tyler, there's, you know, somebody else from the crypto sphere. And I know Joe knows a lot of people. And I just feel that there has to be a way that the crypto sphere can help fund, like, even if it's not about creating a project, at least through donations can help fund, you know, and how can we, how can we do something to help instead of, you know, just, I don't want to say it's just personal enrichment, but there's a lot of that. <laughs> So sorry, that was a very spiel all over the place, but <laughs> I just woke up. <laughs> and um, as for what, what I hope for this meeting is um, just to learn more about the funding. And I guess I was talking to Joe about like what is considered acceptable funding, what um, what are like, you know, it, it, like uh, somebody else said, is there a plan or their deadlines um, in my day job? I'm an accountant, so I'm very used to like okay, this, you know, this is due there, this is like deliverables and how to, how to get there. Um, and I think seeing the effective altruism community in, in action a little bit, I thought, wow, like these guys have figured it out <laughs> how to get things done. And, uh, you know, I always considered my parents and were kind of like altruists, but when I heard about in effect, effective altruism, I think, oh, well, we're kind of more ineffective <laughs> altruists. So, it's like how to how to use some of these new models and stuff that all of these technologies and stuff are using all tech, but to use it to maybe things for me that are more positive, such as like regeneration and charity and donation. Cool. Thank you, Allison, for giving us a little bit more of an introduction to yourself with those thoughts. I think that's very helpful. And thank you everyone for 
helping us to create a structure around our agenda. Because I think it's very clear at the pattern level of what everyone has said, that there's a real desire to start becoming concrete and to be able to develop the capacity for coordinated action or at least modular action that achieves coherence within a shared time frame of objectives. And at the same time, there's a desire to hold the somewhat more meta, somewhat more philosophical aspects of, you know, how are we going about doing this? What are we learning as we go? And how does trust, as Scan so aptly named, play into all of it? And I think that just with those elements, we can hold an agenda together. And what I think might be helpful is to give a brief um, summary of what I say is the method and the madness of what I'm, what I'm doing as the facilitator of this process, um, which is how, uh, how I've learned to use improv improvisational techniques to create uh, engagement, to create emotional connection, and then to create enough messiness that people seek structure, which is a really important blend. If it's too structured at the beginning, it doesn't actually engage anyone. And so there's a, there's a method in the madness here. The method in the madness, which is also a summary for Amber who asked for a bit of the history. And Allison, this will help bring you up to speed a little bit as well. Um, so the idea for the Body Char Regeneration Fund is something that I've had in my mind since before we came to Colombia, back when our family lived in Costa Rica more than a year ago. When I was working with Stuart Cowan, at the Capital Institute. And one of the frameworks he was really working on, I was just on the periphery of at the time, was this idea of creating bioregional investment platforms across the Regenerative Communities Network, which is a network that aspires to be a network of place-based projects like what we're doing in Body Char. Um, unfortunately, as PJ knows well, because he's been interning with the Capital Institute, and as Gail and Rachel know well from other contexts, when you try to do these radical things, these very different things within NGO models, you end up getting painted into corners. And the corner that Regenerative Communities Network got painted into is that they need to have paid staff working for a nonprofit, which means they need to be successful at grant writing, which means they need foundations who actually understand what the hell they're doing. And so a lot of the Regenerative Communities Network has sort of come to a standstill or has slowed down dramatically because they're not able to convince funders that what they do is anything understandable at all. Even though what they're doing is very much what we're doing. It's, it's equally as deep and complex and important. And so, um, and I know I was on the team last year, so I know this. And so in many ways, this is an idea that um, sort of I was holding in my awareness as we looked at what we might do in Body Chara while becoming part of the community here. So I would start talking with like our friend Vivi, who's actually in the other room right now, visiting with Jessica, um, would take me to visit her neighbors in El Caucho and say, maybe some of these people are interested in reforestation. Maybe they'd find some way of sharing their land if you're creating an education program to do reforestation on their land. And I was already immediately thinking about how to decolonize the land and what kind of circulation of value flows would be a part of it. So I was thinking in terms of bioregional investment platform even then. And um, the real moment of activation for deciding that we should just create this fund was seeing um, after the lockdowns from COVID, which had shut down the tourist industry here. It was like 80% of the economy turned off overnight in March. And they turned it back on in September. And we started having chronic water shortages in all the houses in town because all the hotels were filling their swimming pools for the tourists. And all the people from the city who had been locked in their apartments were now looking to buy land here, which is accelerating deforestation. And there's already not enough water. And so it was very clear that we needed to try to interrupt that economic model before it fully, fully turns itself back on. So there's no time to wait to figure out how to create this fund. Let's figure it out by creating it. And so by you know early mid-September, when I was seeing that beginning to happen, it was like, how quickly can we just get started building this damn thing? 
And that uh, you know grew with the community regenerators cohort that was preparing a capacity, a, a, a really an intermediate level of capacities for earth regenerators, which is now becoming part of the infrastructure and will roll out into the network soon. Hola, Lucia, ¿cómo estás? Buenos días. Oh, ¿qué pasó? Y solo tiene, tiene un zapato, ¿por qué? Ah, necesita más, más pegante para este zapato, sí. Ah, pregunta mamá, ¿por qué está en la cocina? Sí, estoy hablando con amigos. Sí, sí aquí, aquí es Lucio. That's Vivi's son. Um, and so, uh, so what's happened to sort of summarize this, we had our first meeting, our work group meeting to say, people said they'd like to be part of doing this. Let's have a work group meeting. Hi, everyone pat ourselves on the back for being among such cool people. The very next morning I launched the GoFundMe campaign. Yes, me. Because I knew as Tyler said, the only way to learn really is to try to take actions. And because all of these things are happening, whether we're ready for them or not, we need to figure out how to operationalize this fund even before it exists. And I'm very pleased to say that a mere three weeks later, we raised more than $7,000 in the fund, $7,373 at the moment, um, which has some GoFundMe fees and other things. So it's maybe about $400 less than that, but I think around $7,000. And $7,000 converts to about 25 million Colombian pesos, which is not enough money to buy land, but it's enough money if we directly gave it to campesinos to do projects to probably run 30 projects. It's a huge amount of money. Oh, gracias, Lucia. Um, and so what we did was I did the uh, cart before the horse on purpose. I prepared the cart that would need the horse is we started raising the money without having a local decision-making team because I knew that we wouldn't form a decision-making team around the hypothetical idea of raising funds. We'd only form one if everyone is afraid the gringo guy from the North was another colonist. And we wanna be really careful not to let it be more colonialism. And they'd be strongly motivated to form a governance team if we had a budget to spend. So as soon as we hit around the, the $4,000 mark, which took about four days and go fund me. Rumors started circulating in the little village of Bodhichara. Who is this white guy who's raising money claiming it's for Bodhichara? Which compelled people to reach out to me and ask if we were gonna form a governance team. Just as I was about to ask them to form a governance team, it was perfectly timed. And so now we have a local team that's formed and we're designing the process. And one of the things that uh, has come up in the process is we've created a set of criteria for the fund, which I can share with all of you in a moment. And I wrote a post about it um, in Earth Regenerators, but I'll walk through it with you about the thinking behind that list of criteria. And the reason for having this list of criteria is that a member of our team in Barichara is a woman named Natalia Ortiz, who has spent about 25 years working in international NGOs on women's issues and conservation. And she's helped set up nature reserves in places like Santa Marta with the Kogis and has done work all across Latin America. We're, it's just amazing the people who live in Barichara. We have this woman here who with her partner, they got, they got trapped in their, their like weekend getaway finca that's near Guane, just below Barichara when the lockdowns occurred. And because they both work in community organizing and environmental management, they immediately started talking with all their neighbors, organized them, created a community mm. garden and have about 25 neighbors. This is very rural campesinos who created a food subsistence system during the lockdowns mm. on their land. Like this is the kind of people we're talking about. They're amazing what they're doing. And so Natalia was the one who said, oh, I have a friend in Brazil who created a fund about four years ago. It was a women's fund initially. And then later they created the same structure for an environmental fund. And the idea was that the big, there's a lot of money in Europe for um, 
for you know, domestic violence and women's issues and environmental issues. But it's all at such a large scale that it doesn't have the ability to directly go into the hands of people who are local rural people, which by the way, often don't even have things like bank accounts. How would someone in Europe even have the money? And so what they figured out was there was a way to create community councils that could apply for funding. And then they could disperse the funding directly to local people. And they did this initially with a women's fund. It's a sort of like Grammy Bank and their micro, uh, micro lending, except it was micro gifting instead of micro lending. And basically what they do is they create criteria for the fund and then the local people submit proposals and a local council decides if the proposals meet the criteria and then they just quickly, as quickly as they can, put the money into circulation, put it into the hands of local people to do local things. And they started this in Brazil with a group called Fundo de Casa. That's the link I shared with Max and PJ earlier. And it was so successful, they've now replicated it in four other Latin American countries in South America, including one in Colombia. And Italia is friends with the people who created it. So we're going to see if we can just partner with the Colombian Fund to receive international money through their networks and direct it into Bodhichara as, as another pathway to bring money. But I wanted to share this way of thinking with you because when I show you in a moment, actually I'll do it right now, I'll show you the, uh, the criteria and then this will allow us to create our agenda together. So let's see here, got it over here. Just a second, I'll grab a, this graphic for us right here. So you can see this graphic, it's this text on my screen. These are the criteria for our fund. This, this is the first version of the criteria for our fund. There are a couple of elements to this that are really important. So the first thing is we're gonna map out the territory. So we're already talking with um, a friend here in Bodhichara who does satellite remote sensing work with the British Space Agency, who lives in Colombia and works remotely. He's got friends who are drone operators. So he's gonna to talk to someone that does freelance work to come in January and bring a drone and create digital elevation maps of the territory in really high resolution so that we can feed that into a, a geographic information system. And we already have Alejandro Zegal, who some of you know, in Chile, who started creating territorial maps for Bodhichara. And we're also gonna work with some other GIS practitioners in Colombia. And we're gonna create a really detailed technical map, a map of the aquifer systems, of the types of soils, of where there's forest, where there's not forest, and other things, really detailed technical map. So that from this map, we can bypass political decisions about money and instead look at corridors of ecological connectivity that regenerate the landscape. So we're going to look at tributaries and rivers, aquifer systems, um, migration pathways of animals, and other such ecological and geological structures to create connections in the territory. And then we're going to invite people in the communities who live here to organize themselves around these structures. So as an example, all of the fincas that are in the same drainage basin that depend on the same water supply can organize themselves around their, what's called a subcuenca in Spanish, which is like a tributary or a micro tributary. And they can organize themselves as biocultural corridors where they can start a reforestation project or a water retention project around those ecological structures. Now our practical goals are to increase water security, which is a chronic issue here and can organize everyone because all of us have needs with water. And we protect the water supply by regrowing the native tropical forest, which has an implicit assumption that we have to maintain the indigenous or the local knowledge of plant uses, building materials, uh, medicines, how to create clothing and baskets and all kinds of other local crafts that are part of the, the forest economy of the people of the Andes here. So implicit in reforestation is this culture of practical uses. Um, and so this means we organize the efforts of the fund around functions and structures of landscapes. 
and we invite the people, the rural people in the landscape to organize themselves. Now this leads to the last one, which is what I was saying about the women's funds, is we minimize bureaucracy and directly work to the greatest extent possible with rural Campesino families. So the idea is with these criteria, we can invite uh, local people to submit proposals. If they organize themselves around something like a drainage basin and want to do reforestation work, then they're already organizing themselves into a biocultural corridor and they are now um, eligible to apply for funding. And as an example of a way we might use the funding, there's a place in Santa Elena, which is where a lot of the agriculture is, where 14 farms of campesino fincas have already organized a composting system to build soil, where when they trim all, it's a bunch of coffee farms. When they trim the, the branches of the coffee trees, they bring all of them to a central location to do composting. And then the farmers are able to come back a year later and collect compost to take back to their farms. So if another area wants to imitate this and create their own composting within their own neighborhood, then we have a place they can go to to study and learn. And maybe what they need is someone whose job it is to build a composting system. So the community might apply for funding to pay for, pay for the livelihood of a person for one year, which might be something like 800,000 pesos per month, which is about 200 US dollars. So they might apply for about 1,200 US dollars to pay for a one year salary of a person to just build a composting system. So this is an example. And if it meets the criteria of the fund, we just give them the money. And the idea is we put the money in circulation as quickly as we can. So I wanted to share this with you to show you what has been coming into being as we are figuring out how do we structure this fund and how will the fund work? You can start to see some of its elements. And this can give us some insights mm -hmm. into um, how can we, as this group, create action plans and timelines to feed into a system like this? And the one other part I want to share before opening it up for discussion is that there's another level beyond what I've already talked about, which is acquiring land. Mm -hmm. Which it turns out that we're not raising enough money so far to acquire mm -hmm. land. But if we converted the $10,000 that was set aside for the land in El Caucho, is about 40 million Colombian pesos. If that became available for this general fund, then together with GoFundMe, we have something like 65 to 70 million Colombian pesos, which is a huge amount of money. It's enough money that we could spend all of it to buy one small piece of land, but then we have no other money to do anything else with. Or um, we could split the money, or maybe half of what we've raised so far goes to these community projects in the next year. And the other half is accumulating for the, toward the first land acquisition. Or what I think we need to do is targeted fundraising for each piece of land around the projects that they enable. So the land that I've talked about before, Las Albercas, which is 10 hectares of land and would probably cost about $100,000 to buy, but could be the home of the ecoversity for the territory and it would complete an ecological corridor because of the reforestation that's happening on neighboring land, we could do targeting fundraising for $100,000 for that land. Similarly, we're starting a conversation as of last night with Gail and the foundation that she and her partner run for nature conservation for parrot sanctuaries, where there's a piece of land, private land, that we just learned about. A local ecologist took my wife there a couple of weeks ago where the only parrots in the territory go to this cliff to lick the minerals in the morning, to be able to go to fruit trees and be able to digest the fruit. And it, it's possible to start a negotiation with the landowner about protecting the land, which is a perfect alignment and partnership with, with One Earth Conservation, the foundation that, that Gail is associated with. So we might have specific strategic partnerships for land-based projects or specific fundraising and investment packages for each piece of land which goes above and beyond this general fund or this way that I described the general fund so far. But I wanted to just hold awareness for both of those levels because we need to be able to do both, um, which creates some really interesting trade-offs. Um, so that's, uh, 
a summary of what's happened so far and where we are. And um, what I'd like to do now is just have maybe one round of discussion of reacting to and building upon what I just said. And we can use a, a modified sociocracy approach, which is simply that we'll speak in terms. So just like the first round, we'll do one round of sharing of thoughts and reactions to the, the update I just gave and give Brett the opportunity to say hello since he joined us a little late. Hi, Brett. Um, and then we can start to create a second round around what kinds of actions, what kinds of timelines make sense when we have all of this coming into being and we have this new level of clarity around what we're doing. We, you can see it taking form. It's not fully formed yet, but it's much closer to being formed. So we can start to talk about what to do with it. Um, so I'd love to just have one round of sort of thoughts and reactions to this sharing. And then we can do a second round about, which is a brainstorming round of, about what we as this group can do to support the formation of this local structure. And the only final thing I'll say is my current intention is the amount of money we've raised so far needs to be completely spent in the next year. We're not planning to hold money. We're trying to put it into circulation. So if we raise more money, we'll put it into circulation too. Um, the intention is to create patterns of cooperation using money as a support capacity. So, um, so that's it. I'd love to just start a round of reflections and reactions. Maybe whoever would like to go first and then pass it on, pass it forward to the next person like we did in the previous round. Uh, but I'll, I'll invite whoever is ready to go first. Uh, Stan, yes. Well, congratulations. I think it's really exciting the amount of progress and I appreciate the cultural evolution history as well as the regenerative capital history. Uh, this is a great acceleration of the evolution. Uh, you know, I think the Natalie is also a colonist, right? Like you coming in to help and, you know, we can help preserve parrots and other of our global initiatives. But I was wondering what, what the community wants. A lot of times community has its own interests. And I think security and water security could be it. Um, but I was thinking about, do people really want their land bought? Maybe what they really want is their land to be put in some sort of a trust. And, you know, I like the idea of the money getting put into flow. But I, I think it's kind of important to see what the locals really want, the community want. And I think if it's what they want, you don't need to buy the land. I think you need to help them set up the thing they want in a more equitable way so the colonials don't take it over <laughs> for Paris or whatever. I mean, um, so I just wondered if you had, you know, Natalie's a real important resource, but she's also sort of like us, right? Yeah, thanks for that question, Stan. I see Amber's raising her hand, so maybe Amber would like to pass. Yeah, I just, I'll hop on to that. Um, I agree with Stan. I think it's really important to consider what, how the local people want to engage with this process. And a land trust makes a lot of sense. Um, my concern is if you're only doing the model where the, uh, the campesinos, the indigenous campesinos are restoring the land and paying only for that rest restoration process, is it possible to make sure that it's uh, not going to get bought up and destroyed or, you know, uh, turned into something else once the ecology has been um, restored. So that that's just my only concern and thought that came up. Very important, Gamber. Thank you. And we're thinking a lot about these issues as well. So I'll withhold comments for now, but I see Gail is ready to go next. Uh, I wonder if has a lot of experience with this kind of thing because we work with local people. A lot of them are indigenous people. And it's a kind of combination of definitely wanting to do what the local people want, but also education and changing attitudes. Um, a lot of the people 
my partner's name is the Reverend Dr. Laura Kim Joyner. She's an avian wildlife veterinarian, has been doing this work for over 33 years now. And uh, one thing that has happened is a lot of the people she's worked with are were poachers. And the reason they poached the parrots was to feed their families. Um, but when she started working with them, she they learned to value the birds for things beyond bringing them $20 or whatever. And their attitudes have evolved and changed through the years where they want to protect their birds. They, we're not telling them you got to protect them. They want to. Even now with the hurricanes that just hit, some of our projects, they are feeding birds that have no other food because they want to help them. Um, so you have to kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's tricky because you don't want to tell people what to do, but then again, they may not realize the value of what's there. Um, so I, I don't have the answer necessarily, but I do encourage us to not just say they alone make the decisions. It, it has to be, I don't know how yet, but combination of training, education, guidance, and what they want, all those together. Yeah, the way that our, our team member Margarita says it is it's all about changing mindsets. And our, our friend Vivi, who uh, wants to help her neighbors to become better land stewards, it's about helping them cultivate conscience and care for their own land. And so these are very important themes. And I'm lovely, lovely to hear them reaffirmed here. Um, who would like to go next that has a reflection to share? Uh, Max. Yeah, um, yeah, I like this idea of changing mindsets. Um, and what I'm thinking about is the reason that it's the mind that needs to be changed is because at the level of the heart, we, we, there is so much resonance between people and among people. Uh, and what I'm thinking about is story and how to, how to tell a story that is resonant with everyone. Um, it's my personal belief that regenerative work is something that is in everyone's interest. And so learning how to frame this as something that, mm, yeah, through story um, is a way of getting investors on board, I think, um, to speak to the other side of the coin. Um, and then, yeah, also, uh, this is just me kind of sharing, being transparent about what I'm seeing. I don't necessarily think that it's a new piece to the puzzle. Um, uh, I think Stan's kind of been on this a little bit already, but in terms of how to um, incentivize um, local participation, in addition to, you know, uh, inspiring care for the land itself, um, I, I think food, I think, um, like, like, for example, um, if there were, um, a land trust or some kind of piece of land um, that was in the possession of the fund, um, if, that, if that land could be used to grow food regeneratively, that could then be given to uh, land holding partners as a way of, you know, definancializing the economy. Um, I think that that might be a really interesting perk that would not only offer incentive, but also move us closer toward a regenerative style of economy. So that's all I'd like to say. Yeah, thank you for that, Max. This way of creating commons and then integrating them across activities, super duper important. And definitely on my mind, as you know, Max, <laughs> and we've talked about this a bit. Um, is there someone who would like to go next that has a thought or reflection? Rachel. Yeah, um, I, I, I think um, I'm really resonating with pretty much what everybody is saying this morning. And um, I think it's, um, you know, this idea of that, you know, we're all, we're, we're linking people potentially, you know, globally, uh, and we're all learning together um, as opposed to, you know, uh, being seeing ourselves as the people who are bringing some change. I, I really love this idea that, you know, coming to this with the idea of, you know, we're here to learn, we're here to, to share. Um, I, I've um, been working with a young man in Guatemala who's got a, 
program called Contour Lines, and he doesn't own anything. You know, he comes in and he basically helps fund the planting of food forests in land that is, um, you know, well, more or less owned by. The, 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 there's ownership issues, but he just they just start he just starts helping them plant plan and plant and uh, he links them to funding sources. You know, all his donors are kind of small donors like me, you know, 20, 20 bucks a piece. But he's managed to raise enough money to get uh, several of these little community forests going. And then the local people are invested and they're excited and they ultimately are the leaders of this. And he just picks up and, and moves on and goes somewhere else and, and leaves them to kind of you know, uh, they, they've been building, you know, greenhouses to, to plant trees. And anyway, just to say that this is a model that I think is really exciting to me, this idea that, you know, it's not about coming in and, and setting up this sort of permanent presence. It's, it's about coming in and being really light upon the land and light upon cultures and just connecting people together and kind of then sitting back and let, letting whatever's going to, whatever magic there is in that can just become what it's going to be. And maybe we don't have to know what that is exactly. Just have faith that, you know, if we, if we approach this right, something really good is going to happen and we will get to be part of that. And that's, that's just, know, that's just magic. That's how I feel about it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. I feel the same way. Um, is there someone who would like to go next? Uh, Allison, yes. Yeah, um, you know, listening to what you guys are saying and like what you're trying to do, I think it's it's really inspiring. And I, I think it's, you know, it, it's great that you guys are, I feel like you're like on the ground and you like know what you need to do. And it's just now how to execute. Um, and then hearing, sorry, hearing Matt's talk about like the storytelling and, and you know, a lot of a lot of it, I mean, I spend a lot of time on Twitter because I've, you know, I'm either with my kid or doing some work, but so you can just go quickly in and out. But there's a lot of, you know, I spend, I see a lot of things on like what you call VC Twitter, but, you know, really how the, how these, how everybody is just selling. It's like, how do we sell this? Because to me, it's, it's just so obvious. Like we are all, everything is connected. This should be obvious to everyone. I don't know, for some reason it isn't, but, you know, it's not about, trying to do charity or help other people. Like, I don't see it that way. I'd see it as really you're helping yourself because, you know, we belong to the earth in the same way that it belongs to us. And we are all part of this. So I, I think sometimes being able to tell that story so that it's, for some people, I guess, so for some people just want to like donate, they, they think, you know, it's outside of them, but they feel good for donating, but for other people, it's like, how do you connect them to it so that it's not like, oh, here's just another group of do-gooders, you know, maybe they don't really know what they're doing, but, uh, you know, they have some good ideas, but, you know, it's, so what I guess I'm seeing is that, I don't know if this is the whole group, but is there, I, I do see in, in this, in the tech community that there are a lot of young people who have these same thoughts and, you know, a lot of them are working at jobs and they maybe are at Google or Facebook or other big tech companies and they're starting to feel like something is, is not, you know, they're not getting that meaning that they're also looking for. So I think that maybe there's opportunity to find the people who actually know how to do some of this execution that I feel that we need. I mean, I don't want to offend anyone, but it, it, it seems like, you know, what we need is more money and more execution of how to make that all happen rather than like you guys have all these really great ideas and how do you get that phase? And so it's like, is there an ability to get some of these like younger people? And I say that I'm 40, so I'm thinking, you know, that people in their like 20s, uh, late 20s or whatever, who are, are feeling that they also want something more and they want to feel connected and they want to be part. I mean, everybody I feel is sensing there's a change happening, right? We, we are. We are at the precipice where we're, we're going towards a new paradigm. And I think the people want to be part of it. It was like me, I felt like, you know, I like understanding these things and I'm just like, what can I do? I can't do anything and feeling really 
um, upset and overwhelmed that like, you know, I don't have the time or, you know, lots of money. I have some connections, but not, and it's like, what can I do? So it's like, can we harness that? I, I know this feeling is in a lot of people who have a better skill set than myself and who have better connections than myself. So how do we get those people so that they feel that they can do their part and maybe we can get further along on this execution? Because I feel like the money that you're looking for is not even a lot, um, like $500,000, like it, it's a lot to people you know, who don't have anything, but in terms of what's going on in the world, it's, it's, it's nothing. So it's like, how, how can we get these goals accomplished? Like, what is it that we need to do? And some of it, I think, is finding some other people who, um, who might have those skill sets. Yeah, totally. Something I've started saying to people here in Barichara that are worried the amount of money is too high. Like they're afraid that $500,000 would be so disruptive it would do a lot of damage. And what they don't realize is at least 10 times that amount, at least $5 million is entering the system locally right now from people from Bogota buying land to build mansions on. Right, exactly. And so $500,000 is like a wall against that disruption and, and a tiny one at that. Yeah. And if we're really clever about creating it as an ecosystem network, it's more powerful. Yeah, and, and, and sorry, sorry to interrupt and take up too much time, but it's like all of these things that you guys are talking about and all of these words that come up is, is so similar to what I hear about in the in the crypto sphere. And that's, I guess, what I've been really thinking about is all of these parallel movements and all of these ideas and parallel movements and, and linking them sometimes because it's, uh, you know, I think sometimes people think that they're all alone in these thoughts and these movements, but but they're not. There's so many parallel ones. Um, and, you know, it, it just looks like when someone is talking about the incentives and, um, you know, the fund and how it's managed. And, you know, I think in my mind, it's like DAOs and all of these things. So um, I just think, yeah, there's lots of possibilities. And, and so I'm very excited to see where uh, this all goes. Yeah, thank you, Allison. Um, Stan, or are there others who have something you haven't shared yet? I want to invite that now before Stan goes. Okay, Tyler, Tyler, please. Yeah. Thank you for waiting, Stan. I've <clears throat> been loving all of this. Thanks, everyone. Um, Joe, you used the word wall. Um, and I've been thinking throughout this conversation about um, kind of the need to purchase land as opposed to directing funds towards supporting people's projects or livelihoods. And it seems to me that purchasing land would ideally be kind of a last resort um, that might be best framed as some sort of wall that we decide needs to be put up in order to protect the overall mission from a threat of outside investment or um, kind of decomposition of the land. And I wonder if through the experimentation with kind of changing mindsets, there's a couple of different strategies or kind of orders of operations that we could start to sense into of, okay, before we go to that last resort, what's step one in terms of a conversation? What's step two? What are the different strategies along that? And as a last resort, if we decide that, okay, it, it does need to be purchasing this land to protect it, um, then kind of all that is, is communicated to potential donors so they understand exactly why money is being diverted towards buying a specific parcel of land. Um, and I think that might enhance some of the trust in people like Allison, you were saying, who don't have a lot of experience with this work, but are just feeling a calling to support and, and want some trust that the people on the ground doing this work are being very thoughtful about it. And they'll get to learn something in return for reading through the description of, of why we're deciding to purchase land as opposed to something else with it. Yeah, this is a really good point, Tyler, because what we're learning is that the way to decolonize land is to decolonize human minds, which shouldn't be surprising if you follow the decolonization movement. But one of the ways to decolonize land is to make the ownership unimportant. Whether I own it or you own it, and we actually had this happen with the land in El Caucho. We were talking with the people about maybe buying the land, but the price is too high, we didn't have enough money. 
um, maybe not buying the land, but leasing it, but no, there's not interest because two family members are really money hungry and just wanna sell and make money. So they wouldn't lease it and then avoid the ability to make a profit. And then eventually to the point where we said, well, what if we, uh, what if we don't buy the land and instead we create a nature reserve and your children inherit it. And there came a moment in that conversation when the family realized that owner, us owning the land wasn't the deciding factor for us. It was whether or not the land was going to be regenerated was the deciding factor for that moment in the conversation. Now for us to honor the trust placed in us by our donors, we have to show that there are some legal protections which in this case would mean creating a nature reserve, you know, applying for the legal status of a nature reserve that sets res restrictions on the land. Um, so if we didn't buy the land, then we would help them, help the, the owners now to set up a nature reserve that they would have a hard time selling because it has restrictions legally bound to it. And so this way of being very uh, soft to own or not to own is really stark. And instead we create a space of gray. But one of the areas where we find we do feel a strong need to buy land, which Las Albercas is like this. The current owner is a, is a local parasite who owns about 50 properties and is a total like psychopathic um, capitalist who happens to be from Bodhichara. And the person who's trying to buy it from him to make a quick buck isn't from here and doesn't care about anything local. So if we want to protect the land, then we need to buy it to protect it. And so it's much clearer that the land is in danger of a bad kind of development and that buying it would very clearly protect it. And if we bought it to turn into a community project, then the community would, in a cultural sense, the community would own it by having a nonprofit organization that's the owner. And so again, it's a blended ownership space, even though there would be a legal owner, there'd be a nonprofit legal owner. But playing in this gray area is essential for this work, just super important. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And we need to get clear on what those criteria are. Um, so I know Stan had something to share. And then after, oh. if there's anyone else. Well, thank you, Joe. I, I think those are two great examples of uh, what Max was talking about. Story by story, sort of understanding the culture and helping it evolve in the first case, the story, you, you explained how the story tipped, you know, the culture and, and people bought into a new story. And in the second case, we still haven't discovered the story. So it's very much at risk. But, in, but if there were such a thing as a nature reserve, the property could be rezoned by a different culture. And one of the things I think is uh, kind of shared is this story is we need to do rezoning. So even in my backyard, the big thing is rezoning from single use monocultures, uh, you know, which you know, regenerative agriculture really explains. And, and the parrot really explains, you know, we really need to learn that the birds have a lot to bring to our backyards. And we Audubon Society certifies our backyards in Portland as one of the key things everybody can do to get started. And then I think, um, you know, activation, it, it is cult, you know, cultural evolution in my backyard is kind of what everybody's trying to do here. We don't expect to own land in Colombia. Um, I'm interested in helping Colombia because I like parrots, you know, but, but I really want to do it in my backyard. You know, I don't want to be killing the birds in my backyard um, while I'm helping Columbia. So I think everyone expects this story to apply to their daughter, you know? Mm -hmm. And the thing that makes sense is the stories that get people to think beyond themselves to their daughters or their daughter's daughter. Um, and so I really like what Max said. I do think it is story by story. Um, and I do think the pictures that you're doing in your social methods are so valuable. So besides the cryptocurrency kind of uh, activities, I do think the storytelling media is partly why you're so good at this. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing we need in our backyard, the parrot story of 
why do you need it in your backyard? Um, uh, thank you, Stan. Um, are there others who'd like to comment? I see Gail here. Yeah, I know that you know Michael Dowd because that's how I discovered you. <laughs> how he interviewed you. Michael Dowd is a is a, a minister who talks about something called the Great Story. Uh, he's all about story, and he went from being a fundamentalist Christian to a, 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 a basically like a humanist at this point. Um, uh, and, religious naturalist is the term. Religious naturalist. That's his latest. Yes, um, and and so he is developing stories that would appeal to everyone, no matter what your belief system is, um, and, and puts it in the context of nature and the universe. So I just want to let you there know there are people out there working on this also. So he, his, he's not as sophisticated as Joe is with his medium, with his website, for example, and all that. But you can check out if you just, um, Google Reverend Michael Dow, D-O-W-D, The Great Story, you'll see some of what he's working on. So he's the one who first got me, turned my head, because he talked about how we're all star stuff, we're all made of the same stuff, and the earth is basically, I, I don't know if it was him who came up with this idea or someone else, but it's the earth becoming conscious of itself. You mentioned even conscious evolution in, your, in the chat. He talks about that too. The earth through opera and this and that, the earth is becoming conscious of itself in the universe. So it's it's neat stuff. And his son is living here in Body Trust. <laughs> really? I didn't know Shane. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's great. Shane, uh, his son Shane married a, a wonderful Colombian woman named Daniela. And they live in that ecological corridor with Las Albercas. Um, I wanna invite uh, a few more comments and then we can actually start creating some action plans and structure because that is a very obviously desired outcome of this meeting from the agenda we created. So I see Max has something you'd like to share. And also we haven't heard from uh, PJ or from Brett in this round. So if they have something to yeah, I just wanted to tag on to kind of uh, Stan's train of thought there with the story by story uh, notion. And I thought, you know, is the wall that's that changing mind runs into a legal wall, you know, I mean, because we are dealing with, you know, legal agreements about land ownership. And then it occurred to me that the idea of law, which um, defines how a land is to be used is kind of a kind of a colonial <laughs> uh, function because it's sort of like extracting a notion about how land is to be used and it's creating a, a rigid, um, some, you know, seemingly unalterable structure by which we are supposed to adhere, which is not how, how <laughs> the earth evolves, you know? Um, and so, but then, but then I thought, okay, well maybe story can overcome uh, the law. Um, and here would be an example. If, everyone believed that ownership was unimportant, as you say, Joe, um, and people were to engage in something like a, a guerrilla regeneration, then it wouldn't necessarily, you know, if, if, if all of the inhabitants of the area were planting trees and creating swales on the land, no matter whether or not it was their property, you know, maybe that would actually be a more powerful um, uh, force than the law itself. So that's an interesting thought. Yeah. And there's a, a great thing, uh, bombas, bombas de semillas is the name in Spanish, seed bombs. You can make clay balls and fill them with seeds. And Jessica has been experimenting with this approach. <laughs> Basically, you could buy a drone and fly it over anyone's land and just drop seed bombs. Because <laughs> there's a lot of abandoned land. <laughs> OK, yes, very fun ideas and many more to explore. But I'd like to invite Brett and then PJ. Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for for welcoming me in and uh, letting me uh, join in late. I know for future meetings, my this will be my my schedule is a little bit late. So if it's okay that I, I drop in late and just kind of listen in, that'd be great. Um, so uh, actually this, you know, I've, I, I'm not even sure where, where Joe, you came into my frame of reference, but uh, it's been uh, really all wonderful information since, uh, you know, beginning to to 
be a part of the, the network here. Um, this topic is something that actually has been kind of in my frame of reference and in my mindset for, for some time and has been kind of a, a guiding force for, for me for some time. And a lot of these issues that you're, you're talking about have been things that I've been, been thinking on for, for some time. So it's really wonderful to really engage in a group that's, you know, focusing on this conversation. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I don't really have uh, too many other comments, not having seen the previous, I've been watching the videos, you know, after and not having seen the update, you know, I don't uh, fully know, I, I really resonate uh, with all of what you're saying, this context specific approach uh, seems uh, very important. I think, obviously, you know, to not fall into the same pathway of, of white saviorism and, and that kind of thing is, is extremely important. Um, but and then uh, yeah, I mean, and then at the at the same time, uh, uh, you know, doing this this work that can have a have a global approach and a global, um, uh, you know, apply just as well in Portland as it is um, in Colombia, right? So um, it it all it, it seems very inspiring and and also it just feels, um, you know, at this juncture in in human history, you know. I, just revisiting uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, ninety nine. What was it? The, we are the ninety nine percent. The flat. The what, yeah. what was the what Occupy was the movement? Uh, yeah, that that yeah. movement, right? And how it began to fizzle out because there wasn't. It, it seemed that there wasn't like an applied vision that that mm -hmm. could be. Um, brought forth it was it was a management approach to things you know uh, more egalitarian grouping of people you know saying the system is not right but then where where did the vision you know go from there and like this seems like so um pertinent and and really a call to stoke the fire within humans all humans to 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 put their energy to something that that can like harmonize with who we are as human beings. So I'm so excited to, to be here and, and thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that, Brett. I remember writing critique of Occupy Wall Street that was published in Yes Magazine in 2012 about uh, basically what I would now call cultural scaffolding. I didn't have the phrase then, but there weren't support structures for continuing development. Yeah. Um, and which is extremely important. And now I have a much better language and clarity to communicate not only why that's a problem, but what to do about it. And what we're doing now, creating social supports and scaffolding is, which includes narrative scaffolding, super, super important. Uh, PJ, I wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, this has been, uh, this has been really good. I. There is one thing, and this will pertain to, I think, Brett's comments a, a little bit, but there was one thing when you were explaining uh, in our first round, so to say, or, or giving updates, that it just hit me in a different way that hasn't, in all the time that I've been engaged in this project, I have essentially before. And that is how we want to quickly deploy funds as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, and it really gave me, I feel like there's this whole space and opportunity where you're working right now in Barichara, a possibility because of that, where you're able to sort of bring the starter culture, so to say, right, of, of money and say, look, we're going to help you. You want to do this project. I know it's small, but like here we have, this will be impactful and we have the money to help you to do that based on the criteria, right? So you can just get that going right away. And then the more that you're able to sort of get these coherently, you know, these coherent projects within a larger frame going, it might then spur more action and more interest within the local community, which then will be able to hopefully garner even more attraction from a global 
you know, system or network is like, hey, these guys are actually doing something and it is actually coming together. And it's like, oh, well, this, okay, this project's going and this project's going and this land right here, it needs like a hundred thousand and it would actually add a crucial piece to this whole puzzle, so to say. Now that becomes way more uh, attractive, I think, to people to fund. So I just, it was a really, uh, I don't know, it's like when, <laughs> when it hits you in the chest and you're like, Oh geez, this is actually, I, it, I don't know. I just got a whole new understanding of the, the project, which is awesome. And then to just to the comments of, I think where you're taking this and just everybody, uh, there have been some comments in, in different regards of like how they've been seeing this project. And um, I see this then as being this, this prototype of sorts that, we're able to move nimbly and we're able to move with minimal overhead and minimal bureaucracy, like you're saying, then the prototype becomes way easier to de deploy wherever you are in the world. So for instance, mm -hmm. you can just take this and be like, look, this is what we did here. Mm -hmm. Like, like something similar for Portland. And as Allison's saying, there's people all over the world and especially in these, you know, major tech companies that have money and want to do something. It's like, if you create a quick and, you know, a good enough fast prototype so to say those things can be iterated on very quickly and then all of a sudden you have a real widespread movement of action so that's those are my thoughts that i wanted to share it was exciting i this whole new world i guess of understanding came into view yeah a very um nice metaphor for this is think about how a zygote forms into a fetus you know, so I'm going to take human reproduction as our example, that a sperm cell joins with an egg cell, and together they form a zygote of two cells. But then they very quickly form into a blastule, which is basically they form a membrane around themselves by attaching to the wall of the uterus, which means they attract blood supply from the mother's body. And at that point, what happens is blood circulation becomes permanent and continual throughout the developmental process from two cells to 30 trillion cells at childbirth, there is continuous flow of, of blood and nutrients from the mother's body into the fetus's body. And the waste is moved back out through the blood. And so this way of thinking is that as soon as it is viable for circulation, it needs to be circulating. And so if you wanna think of that for money, once we have set up a framework of cooperation, then it is viable for, for circulation. It's viable for the multi-capital circulation of social capital meets information capital, meets ecological, like all those capitals are in flow by giving them infusions of continual circulation. And so it almost, oh, who's here? Allison, we have a new visitor, hi. This is Oliver. Hi, Oliver. <laughs> Oh, he's okay for daddy. Come on. Oh, nice. <laughs> Hi. 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 So, so. Hi. How's it going? Um, and so, PJ, you see how this works, right? Is basically once you have a viable blastule, once you have something that's viable of forming structures to become a fetus, you don't ever take blood flow away from it. Robust circulation is essential for life. And so we're just doing that with a micro scale economy, which is a fractal of the whole. And the nested structures are in the landscape. And that's the key is we organize upward through the scales of the landscape. Here's a, a micro tributary, which is, which is connected to a tributary, which is a drainage basin that's part of an aquifer system, but is also a branch of a river. And so we have all this terrestrial nested fractal structure and then layered on top of it is dynamic interactions with the atmosphere because eventually we're talking about regional climate change we want to stop desertification and and return to tropical forest which is a different climate so we're doing intentional climate change and again it's fr it's nested fractal fractal structures here with evapotranspiration on the surface of leaves which by the way the most important is ground cover here, even right now, it hasn't rained in a month, but every morning there's dew on the blades of grass because they're close to the ground 
<laughs> where, where condensation and evapotranspiration can occur. But that's the micro scale of cloud formation. So if you want clouds to form, you do it at the micro scale and connect it. See, it's the same idea again. So we're all the same ideas. ideas. Yeah. So, so now's our chance to apply this way of thinking to this group. And so for the next half hour, we, we can start to create some structure and some, uh, some goals and some timelines around this way of thinking. How can we create this dynamic circulation of moving into flow and action? Thank you. So that this seed of funding that has been generated so far. Okay, go do poopies. Thank you for telling me, Elise. I have a four-year-old, well, nearly four-year-old. She'll be four in three weeks. Um, that what we want to what we want to think about now is, oh, and she's naked and saying hi. Hi. Okay, go to the bathroom, Elise. Go do your poopies. <laughs> These are exciting times. Yes. Um, because what I see as, as a viable way of thinking about upscaling, which can get us to structure action and timelines, is right now we have about $18,000 in the fund from the 10,000 that came before, and this, or 11,000 that came before, and 7,000 that's come through GoFundMe. So I have $18,000 in the fund. And which translates to about uh, um, something like, uh, what's that going to be about 85? No, no, about 65 to 70 million pesos in Colombian currency. And so one of the questions is how does this translate into um, parts of the territory so we can develop community organizing projects in different parts of the territory that are ecologically significant? I think a big milestone for us would be a piece of land we've already been negotiating. Las Albercas, which is probably $100,000 or so to buy. And we don't have a clear negotiation price because we're not in the place yet where we know we have the money that we can do hard bargaining with the owners. And they are intentionally not giving us information so they can try to cheat us. And we have created horizons of trustworthiness in a space where they are refusing to play a game of trust. And so we have a negotiation strategy if we have money to do hard bargaining, basically do ultimatum bargaining, take it or leave it, no more money than this, um, because we have good reasons to know that the person who uh, needs to sell the land is about to lose his investment because he has no other buyers and has a really dumb business model. And we know how dumb his business model is, so we can do ultimatum negotiations when we have money. And so a larger goal is to get to a scale where we could negotiate a $100,000 land purchase. But then what are the kinds of things we'd have to do to get from here to there, just to think in this fractal way? One thing is we want to create a dynamic circulation of projects in the communities that are spread across the landscape. That storytelling is going to show people what we're doing and help them understand it. But another is we're going to need a connection to this group, this group that we are, which is what kind of learning are we doing? What kind of design school is this? What does it mean to participate in this kind of learning? Because what you're probably already sensing is if you participate vicariously in creating this, you will have experience to help create another one. So you're training to build by our regional investment platforms right now. So you can start to think about how do we upscale this engagement that's about something more than the money. And so, so those are just a couple of prompts to get us into thinking about actions, timelines, and objectives. And I see Gail has her hand up, so I'll invite her to speak. But I'd love to just start a conversation around what do we think are reasonable actions, objectives, and timelines based on this way of thinking. Gail, please. Okay, um, I didn't mention before that I'm also a grant writing consultant and I've been doing this for a very, very long time. I already started working with Joe a few weeks ago where I created a draft template of a grant proposal. And we may or may not decide to go the typical grant route. Um, although Joe, it occurs to me if we do decide to work with One Earth, One Earth could apply for funding for that project. Um, and this combines what Max was talking about, about storytelling, because that's basically what a grant proposal is 
and it can be uh, tailored for many uses. It doesn't have to go to a foundation. It can go to an individual, a wealthy individual. It could go to a community. It could, could be used in many ways. So one concrete action I'd like to propose is that we uh, work on finalizing a draft of what I already started. And it will not be set in stone. I mean, the projects are already evolving. So it will evolve as situations change, but that way everyone in the group, I know like for instance, Rachel probably is familiar with the grant writing process, but many of you are not. So it's a chance for you all to learn how that works. What does a grant proposal look like? There's a certain art to grant writing. There's a certain way you have to structure a proposal for funders. And that's the kind of thing Rachel and I can guide you guys about. So that's one concrete step I'd like to suggest is maybe I could share it. The only thing is you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen either. So maybe we need a little subgroup, maybe Rachel and Joe or and maybe one other person who will look at what I wrote and make comments. And then we present a final product to the rest of the group, something like that. So that's one thing I'd like to propose. I love this idea. And just to share one other piece of information now, I have a, an accountant here in Barichara who helped me set up our Colombian business that we're using to apply for a visa. A very complicated culture hacking process with dysfunctional institutions in Colombia. But she is going to contact the appropriate authorities next week to see how we can convert our Colombian business into the foundation so that we can start the process of becoming the foundation. So that, that legal work has been waiting for a variety of absurd reasons having to do with banks and, um, and foreigners in Colombia. Um, but, but that's another piece that's preparing. And I think this is a beautiful example of a, of a work group, a small folk or a task group, I should say. This would be a great task level group to form around creating this fundraising packet. I think that's a beautiful idea. Um, so I love it. And then Rachel, you have something you'd like to share? I just wanted to um, just, uh, Sometimes, what Gail was saying, because I think you know, we talked a lot about today about this idea of telling the story. And I think getting the narrative, the core narrative, especially the why of all of this, um, is, is just going to be, I think that's right where we are. I think that's right where we are, because that, that establishes an identity. And it can be a flexible identity that can be, you know, um, it can be fluid enough to. To, to fit various containers as needed, but I think to get that kind of core understanding of this is who we are, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and this is why it matters, um, and not just to us, but why it matters to everyone. I think that's um, that's exactly what, what I would like to see us be um, honing in on as we, at, at this point of the process, so. And I'm happy to be part of that in whatever way I can. Well, thank you, Rachel. I think we see a group forming potentially here with, with you and Gail. Max said he would like to be involved and myself where we can actually create a, a fundraising package and then share it back to the group for comments. And Mac, and PJ seems interested in some way. Yeah, Max. I can't, uh, my iPad's going crazy so I can't type or anything. It's but I would like to at least sit in to see how that works because I don't know how the grant writing process works. Yeah, and Stan, you had something you wanted to share? Oh, but you're, you're muted. You I like the grant writing idea. I'm dyslexic, so don't use me. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but, but it is great to, I think grant writing is an important way to get the story down. Uh, I really like the nature reserve story and if that actually became a, a law, you know, turning the story into a common law and then the common law into something that people can replicate, then the converting of ownership into services, I think is one of the things that's happening economically. And to get power behind that, if you have a good story, a zoning type policy, a common law reference that can be reused, I think that's very fundable. I think you can get millions of dollars to back that story. So, so we've worked on a number of grants. We have a grant from the Bullet Foundation for Zero Carbon to scale up you know, some of their stories. 
But as soon as you have that, you have people who want to invest $100 million to protect the land around that story. And we have a pilot project with the Science Museum to go from a single use, kind of a waste of land, into a sanctuary for salmon, you know, and birds and, and the waterfront um, that is our lesson learned from both. So anyway, I think if these stories were evolved into policies and we had the rigor of good grant writing to explain the policies in a, a, a structured way, there's a lot of money as, as Allison's pointing out, not just in the crypto community, but people yeah, have everywhere. money that's not being invested in smart stuff like oil. There's a ton of money in the oil patch that needs to go somewhere else. Food security is probably one of the biggest you know, stories that needs to get implemented. And Columbia is a showcase. Columbia is the showcase for the SDGs. Columbia is a showcase for a lot of this kind of stuff. And so if the Columbia policy sort of starts it, that could go global because Europe is looking at Columbia. We are, you know, Portland went to Columbia with a hundred people to figure out how they were doing the SDGs, what they were doing around wellness economy, what they're doing around regenerative, <laughs> and can we buy your coffee? <laughs> without being unfair, without being unfair to the farmers. Right. <laughs> but so, so I think you're playing a very important role of vetting, you know, all this interest in Colombia. But I'm just saying, I think once you get a good story evolved through some good policy templates, you know, grant writing and law writing in some way, I think that that could be immediately backed. Even if you don't have the money, you could say from an investment banker, this is bankable, do it. And that little guy with 50 acres is nothing. You can have real, you know, Deutsche Bank or, you know, somebody you respect but you don't have to do, so that's just a version of the story by story, getting it down into policy. And one of the things we're finding is the smallest policy is the most important thing. So instead of a smart city policy, a smart neighborhood policy, instead of a smart neighborhood policy, a food cart court, you know, something that can pop up. So I, I think, you know, these smaller stories, the advantage of what you're doing is it's very small and replicable. And I really like the starter kit. Yeah, I like it's, that too. It's like yeast, it, yeah. it, it can incubate even, so, so great. Yeah, um, I think we're, we're getting some clarity on one action plan, which is to create um, a fundraising packet, which will help us to hone and clarify the story, which I think is really important. And I like what PJ named as the starter kit. Um, even, it's sort of like a playful wording, but it might be worthwhile for this group to name and give articulation to the design of that starter kit. Just one thing this group can do that's different from what's in Bodhichara is they can extract, you know, clarify, hone a replicable, replicable model for other places. Say so as outsiders, we see what you're doing and we see how it could be done elsewhere. And this in between place is really important. So there's some work that could be done there, which I think is interesting. And the third thing I just wanted to name real quick, and Max, I see you there, is um, another piece of this is those who want to come and learn by participating in Barichara is something to also think about. Because some of you are already considering this, we've been talking, others are thinking about it, but just know that this work doesn't uh, simply need to be that you're learning by participating online from a distance because we're trying to build this capacity to have an embedded school with an ecosystem of learning. So just, just naming that there are action sequences around, around that part of it as well. And then Max, what did you wanna share? Yeah, and just to comment on that real quick, I'm one of the people that's thinking about it. And I think that just the opportunity, that that, that opportunity is available, um, creates a story of transparency and, and inclusivity. Um, around this work that is itself really effective whether, whether or not people participate. Um, so I want to say that, but I also wanted to propose another potential revenue stream um, that's just basically a total rip off of, have you guys heard of the app called Acorns? No. Okay, well, it's kind of, it's kind of aptly named, you know, because an acorn is something, you know, it's a, it's a seed that grows something new and, and larger, and it's, you know, potentially a regenerative <laughs> way of viewing things, but um, this is an app which enables you to link 
a credit card or a bank account um, to, to this app. And every time you make a purchase with, with that card um, or bank, it rounds up to the nearest dollar. Mm, yeah, there's lots of things. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've yeah, yeah. And that, and that roundup goes into a fund. Uh, or just like basically, um, it's the stock market is how the how the app works. It's you're, you're accruing just little di- little tiny bits as you make purchases that go into the stock market. So if we had a, um, mm-hmm. you know, if we have our story in place and we have a way of like mm-hmm. uh, explaining what this work is that is effective for people, perhaps we could have a service where every time they spend money on something that is, I don't know, maybe anything, or maybe it's specifically carbon carbon effective purchases that a roundup then goes into a fund that is this fund. <laughs> so it's just an interesting uh, uh, revenue stream uh, model that I think, I mean, cause, cause in terms of micro funding, you know, in terms of bringing in the people that maybe don't have, you know, uh, you know, bank accounts, but they do have a little bit of disposable income and this provides an opportunity for them that's not very scary, but does total up to quite a big, big amount, especially if you have a lot of people involved. What I really like about this, Max, is to not do it for Barichara, but to do it for the Earth Regeneration Fund. And then basically create seed funding for the starter kits in different bioregions. That if we raise something like $100 million, which which would absolutely overwhelm this little tiny economy in the mountains and in the Andes, it would be a terrible idea to bring that much money. Right, yeah, it makes sense. But if we had $100 million and we had 100 bioregions, then we'd have $1 million funds for each of 100 bioregions for starter kits. So you can see how the scaling of this to the fractal level gets really interesting. Yeah, I think and, you want to have it focused. You know, I think the parrot lovers would want a parrot fund, a parrot acorn, and the food forest people might want a different acorn. The coffee people, you know, want their own acorn, but this could see the acorn idea around regenerative <laughs> patterns. But you probably want to have the passionate focus, right? Of, I mean, I love the parrot fund idea. <laughs> I just want to uh, just throw in too that um, you know, having done fundraising for many years, I mean, you're you're off to a good start, Joe, because you have over two thousand followers already. But One Earth, we've been struggling with this. We we started in twenty sixteen, and we we've kind of somewhat plateaued. It's very hard to break through. I mean, we also, we had a strategic plan. We're gonna raise $5 million and we're tiny and we couldn't, it hasn't happened yet. We're still hoping, (laughs) but I just wanna, coming from a a realistic point of view, like, you know, it's so easy to get excited. Oh, we're gonna raise $100 million, but it's not that easy. So, um, so yeah, uh, just just throwing a little realism in there. (laughs) Yeah, no. Um, uh, Rachel, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, on top of that, I also kind of feel like at some point there needs to be a conversation about systems that may or may not want to engage in, simply because if you look at the big picture, you know, and I'm not, I, I'm not saying anything about anything that's been mentioned now. I'm just throwing this out there generally that there are systems, fundraising, monetary, economic systems in place that do not serve the, the um, regenerative mindset model. And, and, I, and, and you know, I think it might not be a bad idea at some point in the future to have some conversation around you know, what, what practices, um, what systems do we want to be a part of? What systems maybe we would want to not be a part of and to kind of take a, lot, a step back and a big picture view of you know, do we want to encourage people to buy things? Is that is that really what we want? Is that who we are? It, it, and maybe it is, but I think it's a question that that is um, worth asking. And also, you know, Joe, you shocked me in a previous conversation that you and I had. You know, it's like we don't want big dollars. You know, we don't want hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars, which is just you know kind of goes against everything that I've you know been bred and raised to 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 believe in but i think you have i think it's an absolutely appropriate point and the idea that maybe we want to look at instead of big corporate or big monolithic um, investing partners maybe we want to look at investing partners who can have an actual 
emotional connection with what we're doing. So anyway, I just throw that out there. I think that's a conversation probably for another day, but it's mm -hmm. a conversation I'd sort of like to have because I feel like there needs to be some understanding about what streams do we want to dip our toes in and which ones do we want to maybe avoid. And that was the original question that I had asked Joe um, because it was like, you know, that that can be sensitive of like what you know, where are the lines? Obviously, every every group and organization has some lines and it's like you don't want to make them like so narrow that, OK, well, you're never going to get you're never going to make any money because you're you know, you're kind of, um, making <laughs> that, you know, that that's not what you want. But at the same time, I do agree that there should be some lines. And so it's like, you know, you kind of explained to me, OK, well, you know, where where you what you thought in terms of, you know, there shouldn't be an expectation of return. So it's not like an investment where people should be expecting a return on their investment. But I, I do agree with what Rachel's saying is that maybe there should be something a little more explicit, like probably don't want oil money. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. But I want to tell people to not be like, I don't know what people know about cryptocurrency, but don't be put off by that please, because it's a lot different than you might think. And it is a very similar parallel industry. And there's so many parts of it. So there are parts of it that aren't, but there's definitely parts of it that are. But I can understand, uh, you know, where she's coming from. Yeah. And just to share briefly what I said to Allison when she asked, as I said, that we need to be very careful that the money that enters into this fund doesn't have any strings attached from the outside. And that is because of Eleanor Ostrom's design, core design principle number seven, which is that a group is only able to function if the group can manage the jurisdiction of the group. So if you have a group who has to receive oppressive decisions from somewhere else, it is not meeting the conditions of managing a commons. And so that gets translated as if anyone puts money into this fund, it's going to be a local committee that decides how the fund is spent because local people in the community are determining how to develop themselves. We're building commons. But one of the pieces that gets into a gray area is do we ac accept blood money, which is a, one of the ways Allison worded it. And my answer was um, we are in a time where we need to recirculate and compost the old system. So like, Someone who made money with, with the oil industry, if they want to put their money into regenerative projects with no strings attached, that seems pretty welcome. But are there really no strings attached? It depends on the structures. And so this is the key. And this is where small money and big money are different. Because psychologically, if someone gives me $500, I might feel perfectly comfortable not being too influenced by their decision. But mm -hmm. if one person gives me $100,000, it might be very difficult for me as a person to not feel a social pressure. And so what we need is we need governance structures. We need decision-making protocols that don't allow these biases to get in the way. Yeah. And so and one way that this can work is uh, those doing the fundraising from the outside of a bioregion are helping to create a support structure for the bioregion. And the people in the bioregion are largely not participating in the fundraising. This could be one way that can happen. The local governance is basically, we have a budget this year of this much money and we're doing all the things we do with our protocols that we've set up for how to handle it well. Uh, but we're not really having that local committee say, oh, and by the way, it was Richard Branson who gave us the money and he's gonna come visit. Right. Like that sort of, separation needs to be maintained. And I do think it's a worthwhile um, action plan for us to create conversations around this and to map it out more clearly. Because I also think that even if I had all of the ideas right, which I'm not saying that I do, even if I did, from a social commons point of view, it would be a bad idea to adopt my ideas. It would actually be a pro-social process for us to map that out as a community dialogue. I think so, we, so we, we need to do that. I think that's an action plan. Yes, Dan, what were you gonna say? Well, I think, I think this idea, I really like what you brought up. I think that that ownership or the policies are really tricky, but I think it also needs to be bimodal. It needs to be hybrid in some way. So 
just think about healthcare. There is clearly a public health where we're all managing a common pooled virus immunity problem, uh, <laughs> where we need to really follow the Eleanor Ostrom processes. But then there's private health. You know, people shouldn't tell me what I can eat. You know, I should have some choices around mole or masala or, you know, those spices and my communities might be different. So I think there needs to this expectation of, of hybrid, this kind of breeding expectation, I think is really important. And I think, you know, we're starting around food security, which is kind of the commons. And I think that's a really safe, safe place. But I think the community owners need to be able to spice up their food economy on top of their water security uh, in, in right. some way. Joe, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna have to go. So um, yeah, I'm gonna have maybe, to go too. maybe we could share emails or something and I'll, I'll eat. I'm off this oh, week yeah. from work so I can get the grant writing group started. Um, if yeah. I have an email. I actually think we might be at a good wrap up time anyway because it's been two hours for this call. Yeah. And it feels like the emerging dialogue of structures and outcomes is around um, how do we create a clear fundraising, fundraising package mm -hmm. for this work? Another is um, how do we create clarity around the ethics and policies for where money comes from and how that's managed? I think those are two very important threads and that's a lot already actually. Because the third thing that will happen either way is this process is gonna keep developing locally and I'll keep having things to share about what we're doing that we can all learn from. And so we will have this ongoing learning process as we go. But if we focus on those two elements as areas of action, then that's gonna be very valuable. And then the third area of emergent action is for anyone who feels um, inspired or has an idea, something you'd like to do. One, you could just start doing it uh, on your own without, without any need to ask permission. Um, you're very welcome to do that, very empowered to do that. But if you feel that it has implications for the other things we're doing, or if you want help, or if you want to just do it with other people, then you can come to me to just get a sense of how to propose it. Or you could go into the Earth Regeneration Fund group, where we have the topic for a body char regeneration fund, which is like a tagging system. And you can write a post and provoke conversation there. And there are 213 members of the Earth Regeneration Fund group. So that's not just for this working group, there's a larger pool of people there. And so, so you are empowered at any time to reach out to me with ideas, to propose ideas and start dialogue in that group, and to respond to the email threads we have organizing this meeting, uh, or other variations that feel appropriate to whatever ideas you have. Um, but at this point, I feel like we're at a really nice place to just say, it's Christmas Eve. Maybe we should stop at two hours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I'll take care of that baby. <laughs> and let this conversation soak in because we have oh, another meeting scheduled next, next Thursday. It'll be New yeah. Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. <laughs> yeah. That one, maybe you're invited to bring champagne. I don't know. <laughs> uh, whatever you feel like. But, uh, but I will be hosting the meeting just like today, even if only two people show up. Um, it will be on the schedule. Hi, everybody. Fantastic. Hi, Hi everyone. Said, nice to meet you. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you, everyone. And we'll keep rolling from here. So onward we go. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Yeah.